Hi everyone, uh, Dave here. Thanks for coming along to another episode of Legends of the Spire. Uh, this is the podcast where I speak to the former players and managers of Chesterfield FC. And this is episode number 60. So what better way to celebrate uh, than with a, both a player and manager uh, of Chesterfield as I spoke to Danny Wilson. Now, any slightly older Chesterfield fans may remember Danny Moore as a player from when he was with us uh, in the early 1980s in a stellar team alongside the likes of Alan Birch and Jeff Sammons and also previous podcast guests like Phil Bonnyman, Phil Walker and Sean O'Neill. He won the Anglo-Scottish Cup with us uh, and then came back to Chesterfield as a manager um, between 2015 and 2017, uh, which was when we were on a bit of a downward spiral after Paul Cook had left and Dean Saunders had had a short stint. And he came in and saved us from relegation. And uh, I do feel, uh, and I, I felt at the time, that if we'd have kept him a bit longer, he'd have probably uh, kept us up again and the, uh, the decline would have probably been slowed down a bit. Um, but that's a podcast for another day, probably. <laughs> Danny Wilson has got a new book out, uh, I Get Knocked Down, in which he goes through his whole career, uh, over 600 league games playing and over 1,000 managing. Um, please do uh, get the book. Uh, if you get it from the publisher, they've got uh, plenty of signed copies too. So I'll put the, uh, put the link in which you can buy it uh, just in the show description. It was great to have a chat with him and I hope you all enjoy the podcast. Some great memories and some good clips in there too. As always, I'm at Spy Legends on uh, Twitter and Instagram and Legends of the Spy on Facebook. So it'd be great to hear from you. And I hope to see you again next week with the next player. But for now, here we are with episode number 60. It's an interview with Danny Wilson. When do you first remember kicking a football? Um, well, obviously, when as a, as a young boy at school, at primary school, that, that was all I did. You know, it's uh, if I weren't kicking a ball at school, I was coming home and kicking against the wall at home. Um, virtually, I can remember doing it virtually all day, all night. It was um, something that I really, I really loved, and um, I think my father was was involved in in football um, and a semi professional um, side of it. You know, just after the war, mm. when um, when he was uh, in in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, in uh, Derry, he played for Derry City. So I had a little bit of a track record in that respect, a bit of a bloodline, if you like. And um, and so he just he, he just carried on, on on from there, really. Did he ever Did he ever coach you or anything like that? Give you no. anything? <laughs> no, no, my dad didn't have uh, time for that. Really, unfortunately, he was uh, he was always at work. You know, he's trying to bring. Uh, bring some money on to, to feed the family in, in fairness so he worked all God's hours sent and um, so in that respect when we had time he was, he was so tired about the time he'd, he'd had his dinner he was in bed again and better to get up the next morning Did you ever have a plan B then apart from being a footballer? Yeah I was um, I went I was I was working um, I was hoping to be an engineer um, obviously my dad was working in a in a in a company which um, would be taking apprentices on at the time and um, I enrolled for that. And uh, if things didn't work out, I would, I would, I think I would have played part time, uh, semi professional, um, and and had the job as as um, I thought I would have thought as a, as a apprentice engineer, stroke engineer as I got older. Yeah, yeah. right. So, so it was it was kind of you you were at Sunderland for a little bit, um, yeah. weren't you? Was that when Arthur Cox was there? Um, no, no, it was um, when Bob Stoker was the manager at the time there. Um, so uh, from that point of view, uh, Martha wasn't wasn't at the club at the time. Um, and he might, he might have been certain to step up, I think, to the senior bits, but not not for the um, the kids where I was. I was 15, yeah. uh, 14, 15 I was. And um, so um, it was, uh, Arthur Cox was the manager there, but um, it was, there were just, um, you know, youth coaches and, and this and the other, so... Mm. Um, I bumped into one or two of the, the senior pros at, at certain times in the season and watched the first team games, but um, obviously I was never around that area. Yeah, who, who who did you kind of model yourself on then? Who were you kind of looking at in the game that you wanted to be the next? <laughs> there was only one for me, and that was Ian Gallagher, who, uh, who played for Liverpool. He was, uh, I think, it was because of the size. Really, I think both a similar size to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to myself. Um, but he was um, he was an all round player as well. He was. He was tenacious, but he wasn't dirty. He, he could get on the ball, he could score a goal, he could create. Um, and he, he lived not far from where my mum and dad lived, so um, maybe half an hour or so. I'd seen him now and again live, 
off the football pitch. So it's, I think it was, um, it, 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 I would have to say, really, Callaghan was um, my mentor. If, oh, sorry, my role model, I should say. Yeah. So were you always kind of in that position then, right, f- right from a youngster? Because obviously I've spoken to plenty of players, they all start <laughs> up front and then go back or they all, you know. No, I was always around that area, either, either playing wide right or, or inside. Um, I think it was because I was I was fairly quick. So it, it, um, playing a bit wide, it was a bit of a an easy position for myself. But I wasn't a tricky winger, that was a problem, you know, but I was, I, was, I, I like to get involved in the game more. And um and so I got moved inside, and uh, that's the position mostly that I held mm. uh, throughout my career. Yeah, and you had to kind of work your way, work your way up, didn't you? Because obviously you went to, uh, you were in kind of, at, um, at kind of Wigan, and then uh, it was kind of Northern Premier at the time, was it? And then obviously yeah. Bury. Um, so you had to go on that road, on, on that road, didn't you, to kind of working your way, working your way yeah. through the leagues. Yeah, but like more, like a lot of players, you know, in, uh, in in them days, you know, you you work your way up the ladder if you could, and um, the only way to do that was to try and play a heart rate for the teams that you represented at that time, and um, and really that's all I did, you know. I went uh, I went to Wigan, and, and uh, things transpired from that. I mean, Barry had been keeping a little eye on me before, and uh, they came to watch a game when I was playing for a club called Double Seven Club, um, and they came to watch a striker called Gary Dickens, who was a terrific player, but a bit older than me, mm-hmm. and. Um, but they, they were obviously impressive in the game because he kept sending scouts to watch um, when I was at Wigan. So um, again, when I, when uh, the final call came, they, they uh, I was under the contract with Wigan, so they could have spoke to me at any time. And that's what they did. They came. Bob Sto- uh, sorry, um, Bob Smith, the manager came and, and met my dad um, and myself and asked if I could sign for for Barry, and that was it really. But um, but like like I said, like most players, we did have the same sort of uh, pathway. Um, and then from Berry, obviously, you know, you've got to you've got to get into the first year first and foremost. That's the hardest part. Um, there was a lot of ex pros, ex ex, you know, I'm um, sorry, um, all the pros in the in the team that I played in, and players that played in the first division, the old first division then. So um, to get in the team, that was going to be my first um, challenge. In, in fairness, and um, fortunately, I got in there fa- fairly quickly, and uh, and, I, and I stayed in there for a while. And then the progression comes again, as you know, the, the rest of the, of the clubs I went to, and, um, yeah. which is a very similar pattern, really. Yeah. Uh, what was it like getting used to uh, kind of playing in that first team level then? A bit blood and thunder, I, I imagine. It was, it was a, well, incredible. You know, you <laughs> played in front of, you know, a couple of uh, people with a, with a couple of dogs and that, and, and then all of a sudden you're thrust in front of five or six, seven thousand people. You know, it's, um, it, was a, it was a fantastic um uh, experience, I have to say, but and it's exhilarating as well, you know, and you just couldn't wait to get out again, and particularly if you play particularly well and or you, you nabbed a goal or whatever it may be, you've got to win. Um, it was brilliant, you just couldn't wait for the next one, that was what it was. It was, it was very exciting from my point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, really a bit of a novelty, I suppose, and, you know, I can remember, you know, one or two of the players who you were senior lads who were, you know, relying on a win to, to help them with pay the mortgage, you know, and that's, that's how it was in those days, and so, from my point of view, where I, where I thought it was a bit of fun, for other people, it was a, it was a livelihood that, that, that was on the line. And, um, and under no uncertain terms, they would let me know at times, you know, that, uh, you know, hey, you know, this is it's all right for you, but we've got kids to raise here. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, you, that gave you, again, that bit of extra incentive. And it was, from my point of view, it was, it was brilliant that, you know, I could see what it meant to, to the older players. And, uh, and I had to come to the, to the plate with them, you know. And um, so, that, again, it was another... Little learning curve for me, you know, that she didn't take anything for granted and, and understood what other what other priorities were for other players. Yeah. Did did those older pros kind of look after you on the pitch? I, I remember yeah. a great story from uh, I think it was when I was talking to Phil Walker, he was saying that a player came up to him once and said, You see that stand, you're going in it. And kind of Ernie Moss came over and said, you know, don't talk to him like that. <laughs> and kind of kind of looked after him on the pitch. Do you ever uh, yeah, listen, there, there was there was all that intimidation, you know, in our days all the time, you know, it's um, you know, you've uh, you'd you'd be in front of one or two tackles that come flying in at you if you got a bit cocky and you you're going past people or you'd scored a couple of goals, or whatever, you got sorted out. And and that's when the senior pros would come and stand by you and you know, they they point a finger and say, Well, you know, it's you do it to him, you're going to get that very shortly, sunshine. And and true to to to, to the words, he would do it, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. the referees could see it, the referee could understand. Then turned a little bit of a blind eye, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, they were just meeting a bit more out than as well as delivering it. Mm-hmm. 
team spirit. That's team spirit for you. <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. And um, and you kind of I, I read that it was a a game that Chesterfield played against Bury in in 1980 that kind of it was a few months later that then you signed for Chesterfield yeah. um, and kind of on the Chesterfield history website you know it said that you were one of the standout players on that day so um, how did it all kind of come about that move to Chesterfield? Well um, if, I, if I'm quite honest I don't know um, you know in those days <clears throat> you only knew what the, the club were going to sell you you know you didn't you didn't have agents who were phoning clubs around for you and, and touting you about and newspapers that people were picking up and this and the other and the social media you didn't you know if that wasn't it was around it was it was down to people who were out watching watching players and scouting players and a team of, of people like that um, and then the next minute I know I was pulled into the office um, at Bury and, and I was I was told that you know Chester was coming for you we were accepting a bid for you and, and you're going over there to talk to them which is exactly what happened and uh, so it came very much out of the blue and uh you know, from that point of view, I, I really I played at Chesterfield. I didn't know anything about it, if I'm honest. I was, I was only just finding my feet at Berry, really, because um, I'd never heard of Berry before I went to him as well. You know, I was a little Wigan lad and, you know, very young and, and not travelled at all. So uh, so going to Chesterfield now was another another challenge again, another another um, opportunity to, to broaden my horizons, if you like. And then I went over and I met uh, Arthur Cox. Um, very much impressed me as, as Arthur would impress anybody. Um, real football man, very committed to to the to the cause, um, and very disciplined. And, and I quite liked all those those traits about him. Um, and again, obviously, you look at the team as well. And I've, you know, I've gone back and I've seen who was playing for them, and and obviously, I played against them as well. And I thought, well, you know, it's a good opportunity again to another step forward, and, and that's what it was. It was, it was a stepping stone, really, I, mean, I suppose, to uh, to the next level. Mm-hmm. I suppose people don't really appreciate uh, nowadays that the the power that players have nowadays it wasn't uh, wasn't always that way, was it? I suppose. No, far from it. You're quite the opposite, really. The clubs have the, the upper hand on everything. You know, they dictate everything. You know, to um, you know, you know, for a footballer to go in and, and, and slam a transfer request, it had to be really, really serious to, for him to do that. Um, yes, it did happen. Of course, it did. But it, you know, it's few and far between. Nothing like nowadays where. I don't suppose really seeing the players are doing nowadays. It's the players who do it on their behalf, you know. And uh, you know the the face to face meetings that he used to have with managers and and um, a chairman. Um, it doesn't happen as much nowadays. Um, but um, but I feel that you know it's uh, from from where I was. I was just running the mill thing. That's what happened. That's what you got on with. Yeah, and I've I've heard about Arthur Cox's pre seasons. I've I've heard about these runs out sending you up to Kerber and then. Uh, I've heard about him kind of leaving leaving people behind that didn't get back to the cars in time and things like that. I think oh yeah, you know, like Steve Grizovich and people like that have spoken about having to go on these big runs. Did you quite enjoy them? Um, well, I was fit. Yeah, I was okay. You know, I weren't too bad on it, but um, they were they were they were very very difficult. You know, to up George Kirby used to run a pig farm up in in uh, Chesterfield as well. You know, he run through all the pig muck and everything and. And uh, but you had no tops on in terms of you know a t-shirt and a pair of shorts and that was it. No matter what the weather was, you know it could be it could be minus ten. It didn't matter. But Earth wouldn't let you have tops on and, and tracksuit bottoms in particular. You know, so um, the only way to keep warm was run fast, <laughs> and uh, that's what we did. But I remember um, Sammy. I mean, you might you might have heard this story about Jeff Sammons, who was a, a fantastic character and, and still is. He's what a what a great fellow, a good friend he is. Mm-hmm. But um, Sammy used to have his pubs as well as playing football so um, you know he had to get away from training fairly quickly to change the beer or change the barrels or whatever he did and you know to get the pub ready for people coming in and um, so he didn't really particularly like all the, the long running because he was a sprinter really more than anything Sam and he was coming to towards the end of his career anyway um, this particular day we set off and couldn't find him anywhere like and he, he ended up getting the bus back he put some money down his sock and got the bus he jumped on the bus went back to the ground and didn't bother running like so you know, the, the, the things you get away with in that respect. And uh, I think Coxie didn't like it at terms. You know, he, he, had to, he had to make a stance. But at the same time, I'm sure he was laughing under his, under his breath a bit. But uh, that was the character that Sammy was. I, th- I think it was maybe Phil Walker that, that, that uh, said a, a story about him as well when he was, uh, he'd, he'd had pie and chips or something like that on the way back. And then there was a way in or something like that. And he was a few pounds over. And <laughs> it cost him quite a bit, I think, that pie and chips. 
Yeah, he did. I mean, so many, he didn't mind at all. I mean, he was, I mean, he was well in his 30s then, as I said. And, you know, it, I think he was just doing the football for the enjoyment of it more than anything. He was never doing it for the money. I'm sure he wasn't. And, um, but I think um, from that point of view, it, didn't, it really, really didn't matter to him. He just wanted to, you know, keep that feeling going and going out in front of the fans. And, um, and when he did, he, did, he could turn it on it because he was a hell of a player. And um, so I just think in that respect, he, that, I think the management knew about it, knew really what, what his motivation was. And then I think he turned him up a bit of a blind eye at that. You know, yeah, they did find a couple of quid here and there, but it didn't really make much, much help of a difference to Sammy, I don't think. It was probably quite helpful for Arthur Cox as well, wasn't it, to have uh, that expert? Because obviously he was just kind of starting his coaching career, wasn't it, to have, to have yeah. a bit of... Uh, experience of how to <laughs> treat some yeah. different players was probably <clears throat> very much so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from a manager's point of view, it's a dream. You know, you, all you're all you're looking for. Yes, you want you want them to set the examples in training, but more importantly, it's on the pitch on Saturdays, and that's when you want the players to perform. And um, and Sammy did that on a regular basis, you know. So and and his experience, and we looked up to him, you know. So that was it's great from a manager's point of view to see that type of uh, of respect for your your fellow teammates. through to Walker now Simmons and line it up on the left foot and it's 3 now. Walker again involved to set Simmons on his way Rotherham backed off Simmons didn't hesitate brushed the fingertips of Ogden into the back of the net and, and like you say, some of the talent in that team, I mean, the fans still talk about it now, people like, you know, Alan Birch and Jeff Sammons and yourself and, you know, your Phil Bonnemans and people like that. It was a an exciting exciting team, wasn't it, in many ways around then? Yeah, we had some, we had some very good players, as you, as you rightly say. And, um, and and I think, you know, Arthur and the board of directors at the time, you know, they, they spent quite a few quid on it. They, they, they really had a good push for a club of a Chesterfield size and the, and the crowd they were getting that you know to, to splash out like they did um was a was a big statement and, you know, I was so sorry that at the end of it when it, it tended to break up because of you know reasons of financial more than anything I don't think that the team had to split up because it was a good sign and uh, we were very unlucky in, in a couple of occasions where we could have and should have maybe made the made the uh, promotion places um but it didn't happen and um, unfortunately like I said we one or two of the players were for, for, were not forced to leave, but you know they were in a position where they really couldn't stay because the clubs were offering money for them and the club needed that money. Yeah, well, like you say, that that first season you were here, I think we finished fifth, but uh, obviously that was when Anglo Scottish Cup happened as well, which maybe uh, maybe added a few games onto the season that didn't necessarily help with the promotion push. But uh, it was a, a you played in every game, didn't you, of the Anglo Scottish Cup apart from. The, the second leg of the final, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I um I was injured. I got um I had a, a thigh uh, problem where I, I dislocated a, a muscle from or a separated muscle from the uh, my thigh. So uh, in the tackle it was, and uh, and I missed the the, the game, the, one of the biggest games. But thankfully the lads came through it. Um, yeah, it was um it was blessedly a great experience, wasn't it? At that time there was there was some you know really really good teams in the competition, as you as you well know. And uh, and we overcame we overcame them all, which was a, a real real statement from you know the the club itself with, with what they put on the pitch and um, and it did gel it did gel for long periods of, of time, but really ultimately the goal was to get promotion that was a, the main aim and, and unfortunately it didn't happen but uh, you know it, I don't think it was through lack of trying but you know we missed players at certain parts of the of the season where we we were integral part of the team and um, it does it does take its toll sometimes when your best players are missing. Yeah, how's it uh, in those Rangers games? Because it was uh, they were an interesting couple of games, weren't they? There's still the footage of the planes going to going to Scotland, you know, and and yeah. all of the, the the kind of the all the Rangers fans coming down to Chesterfield at that time. Yeah, it, it was brilliant. I mean, it, listen to play against a quarter side like that in a stadium and Ibrox like we did. I come away with the results as well. You know, the first leg we were we looking a bit fortunate, really. I mean, I can I can see Phil Walker's goal going in now from a corner, uh, but straight in. And, um, you know, from that point of view, I think we we're, were maybe a bit fortunate to hang on to that, you know, the 1-1 one, one up there. But when we brought them back down to, to Saltergate, that was that was a, a monster game. Um, again, like you said, the following that Rangers had, you know, and still have, 
um, as you mentioned. Um, I think maybe looking back in hindsight now, the the, the publicans who are in and around Chesterfield who close the pubs might, might have been regretting it the next day because apparently they went onto the outskirts and, and you know drank merrily and spent a lot of money and not not one problem. Um, and then obviously when it came to the game, we didn't see any problems at all within the ground. Other than you know the uh, the sad faces when they walked home because we 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 played very well on the day and, and had a great result as you know. Yeah, and Phil Bonnyman told me all about him getting turned away from pubs around Chesterfield that night because they thought he was a Rangers fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, you couldn't get any, anywhere. No? That's, that's amazing, really. And, and like I said, the amount of next day they look at the takings of the pubs in the surrounding areas, the amount of which it stayed open. <laughs> and obviously, Chesterfield still still holders of that because that was the last time they did it. So still still holders of a. A European title, I suppose. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder where the cup. I've not seen the cup actually, but yeah, <laughs> it will be somewhere. Like, or I see somebody's house. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it'll be around somewhere. I'm sure. I've got. I've got actually. I've, I've got a picture that was signed ages ago, which, which, which you're kind of on it. I think in the in the bottom corner. Uh, yes. Yes. So, I do, yeah. 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 Brilliant. And obviously, like Frank Barlow took over, didn't he? Because Jeff, because uh, Arthur Cox moved on. So, yeah. what what was it? What was it like? The change of him, his kind of style. My point of view is is a very very close friend and 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 certainly a, you know a brilliant brilliant guy. Um, nobody in in my lifetime that I know in football has ever said a bad word against him. He's he's absolutely brilliant and um, both on and off the pitch. So when Frank took over, it it, it was totally opposite from uh, from Arthur, where Arthur was a, a, a very very strict disciplinarian. Um, don't get me wrong, Frank. Frank's a tough nut. Don't worry, don't worry, you know, behind this, you know, this um, uh, this lovely guy's, you know, uh, face or if you have or attitude, he was a tough fellow, a tough player as well, you know. But so you know, you knew where you stood with him. But he didn't have to. He didn't have to do the things that Arthur did. But um, Frank was a great coach and, and still is a great coach, um, although he's not involved anymore. But he's. Um, but Frank, from his point of view, he's, he, when he took over, he was just a brilliant from the lads' point of view. They loved him to death. So there was never ever going to be a problem there. Um, the only problem that Frank would have was was having to get rid of players, you know, and uh, and that's not an easy remit to have, you know, when when you've been fairly successful and then the team starts to starts to drift away from each other, and that's and that and then getting results again after that is always going to be very difficult. Yeah, football has a habit of going in cycles, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, yeah. Highs, highs and lows, unfortunately, which obviously you know all about having <laughs> having played and managed a lot of games. <laughs> Interesting that uh, that second season. Obviously, I, I think we finished uh, maybe like eleventh that second season. I think that one of my favourite things of that second season was the the goal that Alan Crawford scored from kickoff in the second half, which is yes, still the yeah, I remember, I remember it as well from where um, Alan was. From his point, he just looked it up and he, he saw it. I mean, he, I mean, he practiced in, in training, by the way, um, to see if he could do it or not. But um, I mean, in those days, it was. You know, there was there's lots of things that was that was played off the cuff really, and, and the experience of the player that was that was uh, going to execute it. Um, it was up to them whether they fancied it or not, and and he did. You know, and and, and lo and behold, <laughs> that's what happened. Right? Yeah, the, the footage of that goal is still. I'll still watch it every now and then, just because it's, <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. There's there's sometimes too much of the the long ball to the uh, <laughs> to try and get the get the flick on possession of the pitch from a half and they need to try that more often. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Harland or someone like that could probably do it easy peasy if he tried. Right, yeah, yeah. He, could do it, he could do it in the back heel at the moment, that one. <laughs> so everything to play for as we start the second half here at Saltergate, an immediate sprint for Crawford down the middle. Well, this will be a sensational start for the second half if he can score. And Crawford has them. That is unbelievable. It's no more than six seconds into the second half it's got to be one of the quickest goals to start a second half of all time so yeah obviously you had kind of two and a kind of half season you didn't really miss many games did you you were, you were quite uh apart from obviously you mentioned that kind of um spell in the first season but you were you're were very regular on, on the pitch weren't you you didn't really miss many through injury or anything I was fortunate throughout my, my career, really, in that respect. I didn't, I didn't miss many games at all. Um, one of the biggest, or the longest periods, sorry, that I had missed was, um, I think, when I uh, had a hamstring problem when I was at, at Brighton. Um, and I had to go to Holland to have it sorted. But um, 
and that and that fortunately went um, towards the end of the season, so I could recuperate for the pre-season as well. You know, I got back in in time to play games for the for Brighton, but um, then the end of the season came, so it, it was great. So and that was the longest period I had. I think it was about six weeks. I think something like that throughout my career, which was very fortunate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I've spoken to a lot of players that have had to retire early or, you know, just falling out of the game for whatever reason. Sometimes it's just luck, isn't it? And so yeah. to, to have to, to be able to play, what, over over 600 league games, something like that, well over 600 league games, it would be, yeah. be nice to have been able to go through your career, obviously, without having that time when a bad injury could just knock you out of the game. Yeah, and, and, and really, if, if I'm if I'm being honest and blow me on trumpet a little bit. I think I could have played longer as well because at 34 when I retired, I was arguably the fittest I've, I've been for a long time in, in terms of, of, of my understanding of the game what was needed in my position as well. Um, I felt I could have got another two or three years in playing-wise, but I think it was just the, the reason I finished was because of the workload of player management. Mm-hmm. And um, and that was the only reason. And so so really I could have I could have added to that quite easily. Um, and I was, you know, the level I was playing at as well, I found it never easy, but it, but a lot less demanding. But I had more of a, an intelligence in in terms of of of, uh, of my football and what I and what I was, uh, you know, allowing myself to be able to do and understanding it better. So um, yeah, I could have had, had some more, but I'm not complaining. By the way, you know, it's uh, it's great. But yeah, I, I did feel even at that age, I was still very fit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And- and like before we move on from your time playing with Chesterfield, uh, just a word for the great Ernie Moss, who uh, who's sadly no longer with us. Uh, it must have been must have been great having someone like that to uh, to send the balls to to score goals. Well, Ernie was that uh, everybody who knew knew Ernie and, and were friendly with him, whether it be on the pitch or off it. They'll say exactly the same thing. He was a gentle giant, absolutely brilliant guy, um, such a lovely fellow to be around. Great company. But on the pitch, he was, you know, he's colossus as well. You know, he's he was he was somebody who could get hold of the ball. You know, he never never blessed with with electric pace, as people know. But he would help other players enormously, and, and he was that that um, how can I say that that point in in uh, in your team where you could rely on he, the ball would stick with him all the time, and he and he battle his you know his 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 heart out with you to retain that possession, and then just give it off to you, and that. And that helped so many players in, in like the likes of myself and and um, Alan Birch and Bonnyman, etc. You know, he was um, he was pivotal in how we wanted to play. You know, if we wanted to get on the ball and get up the pitch and, and get opportunities, you get the ball to Ernie and he'd and he'd, and he'd keep it up there for you. So um, yeah, to lose him was so sad. And, and his family, you know, a lovely, lovely family, really, really miss him. I'm sure that you know that everybody who's ever come in contact with him will, will say the same. Um, but yeah, he was he was a legend at Chesterfield, and, and, and will ever always always remain that way. Mm, absolutely well said. Moving on from Chesterfield, obviously your last home game, your last home appearance for us. I think you scored twice in a five-one win against Wrexham, I think, and then and then you were um, you were gone soon after. I think there was a bit of a, a player swap. Was it Steve Kendall and Calvin Plummer kind of yeah. completed moves, and, and you kind of went to Forest? So, yeah. like you mentioned, was that that was just a, a, a balance in the books kind of? thing was it at the, at the time well it was and uh, you know Frank is as I said you know he'll, he can tell the story far better than I can but I knew I know that um, you know over years of working with Frank here, since leaving Chesterfield you know he always told me at the time what happened it's that the club they needed um, 90 grand yesterday and um, and so I think Forrest had found out about it. So a few clubs have, have been sniffing around a bit Derby in particular was sniffing around a bit um, and, and they had the money as well but I think that, you know, um, thankfully, Forrest and Brian Clough, I don't think they want to get into a bidding war, so we got me down straight away and Frank accompanied me down to to the ground. And they said, Brian Clough had said to him, you know what, you know, how much money? He said, I need it, I need it yesterday, I need 90 grand. They said, oh, we'll give you 60. He said, I need 90. Anyway, so, I mean, they came and he said, well, what happens to the 90 grand? They said, it goes straight to the bank. You know, we, we that's what happens. We, we don't get any money. He said, will you not be able to use any of it? And, and he said, no. He said, well, I'll do you a favour and I'll give you two players. They'll help your team and, and um, with a bit of luck, you know, you can you can put them in a the team and they'll, and they'll do some good. And that's when Calvin and, and um, Steve came on the reverse uh, transfer. So, um, yeah, it was that, that's how it was in those days. And, uh, you know, so I ended up going down to, to Forest to a fantastic club and uh, 
But unfortunately, it was the sadness of this situation was the, the money that was needed at Chesterfield. Yeah, yeah. And, and like we've not got enough time to go through all, all of the games and <laughs> clubs you've played for, but um, like of all those managers you've played for, obviously, was, was management something you thought, actually, yeah, I'd quite like to go into this because you obviously played under your Arthur Coxes and, and, and Frank and, and, and Clough and Ron Atkinson and people like that. Was it always kind of something in your mind where you thought, I might have, like to have a go at that? No, no, far from it, no. It's, I mean, I, I just enjoy my playing. I, my concentration was always on the playing side of it. Um, I was told many seasons before, many years before that, that I would be a manager one day, and I didn't had I had no idea why people assumed that. I, I didn't I didn't know that way, and uh, but I must have seen something I don't know. But when the opportunity came, um, when I went to play be play a coach at, at Burnsley first with Van Anderson, who was a big buddy of mine, and um, and it just it grew from there. Really, I got I got into it. I, I enjoyed it. I like the. I like the, I can say, the, the speed of, of, of management. I enjoy the responsibility and, you know, being under pressure, I, I quite enjoy that a bit. That's a bit sad, really, isn't it? But, um, but yeah, I, I just enjoyed all, all around it. But uh, more importantly, though, I love being with the players and on the training ground. And, and I think that's where, you know, that I'd like to think I excelled a bit. The type of manager that still liked to show them how it was done every now and then? Um to a certain age, yeah, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then that certain age, you want to allow you to do it. But uh, I used to join in five sides and, and this, that, and the other. But as time, as time uh, went by, you know, I realised that you know, this, this, I'm getting too old for this. I'm getting knocked about all over the place. I can't get to to balls. I'm pulling my hamstring here, my calf's going here. So, um, so I decided to gracefully step away from the training side of it and, uh, and join in. You know what I mean? Um, but but yeah, just being around the place was it's just great. It keeps you young. It really does it. It keeps you on your toes. You've got to be up, up to speed with everything that, that that's going on in the round you. And it, uh, it's, it's, it, that's the one thing I do miss. Yeah, definitely. And I was a teenager when Barnsley got to the Premier League, and I remember at the time it was it was just uh, it was brilliant seeing them get promoted. So, I mean, what's it like being a having a, a part of that history with the club of uh, of getting in there? It must be great. Um, very very proud. Proud times, if I have to say. You know, I think, I think when you manage any football club, you've got to take on board everything that goes with it, the community and and the understanding of of what that you know the folk are around and around the football club and and the town and whatever. And, and at the time, but Barnes were under pressure. You know, they, all the pits were closing down. The people were unemployed. Not a lot of, of money to spend. Um, but yeah, they they came to to follow the football club, and it was. A little bit of respite, I suppose, with all the misery that was going on around, and they come to a football round and, and vent the frustrations, if you like, if that's what they wanted, or come and celebrate with us. And um, and, and we grew together, in fairness. And I think the, the community certainly, certainly um, had a major part in us getting promotion. They, they pushed us and pushed us. Um, they were they were fantastic. Um, but that when that moment came, when it did happen, and we did achieve what we achieved, it was just it was just enormous, enormous pride. Um, and to see the smiles on everybody's faces and, and the adversity as well, you know, what was going on, as I say, outside of football. Um, it was, they, were, they were brilliant moments, brilliant times. Um, times I will never, ever forget. Yeah. Do, do you keep any of the kind of memorabilia or things like that, any of the, the medals? And do you have them all on display or anything like that? Or is it just something you keep in a drawer and have a look at? I keep them I keep them in a drawer, most of them, yeah. <laughs> I've got the odd photo on there again, but... Um, yeah, generally I just uh, the yes, I've got them. I've got to keep I keep most things. Um, I'm sure when uh, when I'm not here, they'll be thrown out in the bin and go, "What's all this rubbish like?" You know, but uh, um, but the morning time, yeah, they're they're in uh, they're in a place where I know where they are. But if you know, if I just want to look at it now again, I just I'll hold the drawing up. Yeah, and and you managed what over a thousand games, something like that, was it? It's a lot. Yeah, about about eleven hundred games, I think, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um I actually I actually managed more games than I played. So uh, you know, I thought I, I thought my career of playing was was quite all right and long, but but then getting to management and doing it for twenty five years or so, then um it, it puts it in perspective a bit, yeah. Yeah. And and you did come back to Chesterfield uh and manage us for a bit. It was a it was fair to say it was a bit of a turbulent time after Paul mm-hmm. Cook had left and then Dean Saunders came in and it didn't work out. Um so you kind of came in and saved us from relegation, didn't you, that season? What was it like coming in and trying to uh, kind of take over that, that ship? 
Um, it was very difficult, uh, very difficult times. So as you as you well know, well documented that you know Paul Cook did absolutely brilliant when when he was there. And the signings that he made were great, but unfortunately they're gone. The, the signings weren't there, and the players that came in, they were in. Oh, and I'll, I'll say this in all respect to them, they weren't as good as what was left. You know, and um, so in doing so, you don't get you don't get consistency results like people were wanting or expecting, and um, and that's that was a problem. I mean, you know, the likes of Sam Clucas had gone and um, uh, Sam Morsey, uh, Jimmy Ryan, people like that, who were the you know the heartbeats of a of a good successful side, and they weren't there. Gary Roberts, you know, they, and people like that, they weren't there anymore. And to replace them was always going to be difficult, particularly you know a team that's in in League One. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's not a lot of money to throw around. Um, although there was before that, trying to push and trying to you know to to get to that that uh, the holy the holy grail of getting in the championship, and it, unfortunately missed out. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I think that um, to go in there and take the, the helm first and foremost, it was just to stay up. You know, and uh, Dean had come in, did had a bit of a, a difficult time, and uh, and I got on really, really well with Dean. I played with Dean at Brighton, so I knew him very well. And uh, and had a difficult time, and um, the change, and the, I got a phone call to see if I go and talk to them, um, which I did from Chris Turner, and obviously again, I've worked with Chris before at Hartlepool in the management position, but also I played with him at Sheffield Wednesday as well. So, um, so I knew Chris very well, and he just said, "Will you come down and give us a hand?" And I had to think about it really because it wasn't just an instant yes, uh, because I live in the area, and uh, I, I thought. It could cause problems, you know. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to have to walk around the streets and people bellowing down me one way or the other. You know, whether you're done well or you're not. You know, I, I like a bit of privacy. Um, and I thought, well, you know, will will I get it or not? But anyway, uh, it, you know, the, the way they were saying things, I thought, well, I'll give them a hand. And we did, and we went in, and and um, we thankfully, you know, stayed up uh, with a game in in hand. I think it was. I think we stayed with the game before the last game of the season. I think it was. If I remember. Um, but then again, that didn't finish. That didn't finish the problems. You know, the problems were still having to cut the staff and and uh, and and get the wage bill down, which was the most difficult thing um, to do because players were under contract. And as I said at the time, you know, I didn't give them the contract. The club gave them the contract, so they, they, it's always complaining about it. Yeah. You, know, you gave them that, but when you try to to uh, to move players on, you've got a choice. You you know, you got to hope that. A club will will take them off your off your hands with the wages that they're earning, or you've got to pay them up, and the club will prepare to do that. So you've got players who are not wanted, um, but you but the sat there, you can't do anything about it, and that was that was the problem in the second season, and, and all the time, you know. And Chris will tell you himself, you know, being honest, that virtually every day we'll come in, we've got to get rid of him, we've got to get rid of him, and I just said, well, then all the best, where's he going to go, and he's going to pay, mm-hmm. and nobody would do it. We'd make phone calls and say, no, sorry, it's too much money, or. Not interested in not our position, not our player. So we had to try and get the heads right of these lads who they knew themselves through their agents that they were being, you know, totally around to be sold. Difficult, difficult job. How do you manage to get? Uh, I, I was kind of thinking you've been in a few clubs where you've had to kind of avoid relegations uh, and things like that. How do you get? How do you get wins out of a team that is so used to losing? It must be incredibly difficult because once you have momentum. Onto a losing streak, it's so hard to get out of that, isn't it? So- well, it is, and, and you know, and, and it's it's an instant thing as well. You've got to do it straight away because you don't go into a football club with a with a time span of nearly a season to just try and get it right. You, you've got a few months in which to turn it around. Um, and I think that's you know maybe that's one of the strengths that we have, when, you know, as, as myself and staff when we go in, we just try and instill a, a belief in players and. And let them buy into what we want to do. You know, we give them we give them a bit of freedom. We want them to express themselves. We don't we don't shackle them too much. But there's also got to be a discipline. You know, and um, teams that are, are bottom of leagues are generally conceding goals. You know, so the first you just going to plug those holes straight away. And uh, it might look defensive, it might not, but you've got to you've got to give yourself a chance to win games. And by doing so, that means not conceding. And and I think that was the first thing that we did. You know, it just made us difficult to break down. Um, because that's that gives you a chance, and then the other end of the pitch, you hope you've got enough quality, you know, to nick a goal here and there, and, and that's what you 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 you're essential, you know, you put it in in a, in a in a small way that you try and try and do when you first go into a club. Mm. But overall, you you're trying to get get some sort of philosophy in how you want to play the game, and it's attacking attractive football is what I've always wanted to play, 
So I think in um, in that respect, um, you know, that was no different to Chesterfield or all, all the clubs have been to. Mm-hmm. And, and you, like I say, you started off well. You got that 7 1 win, I think, in your second game, something like that. And the Lee Novak's got yeah. a hat trick. So it was. Uh... Um, it was uh, Shrewsbury, wasn't it? Was it Shrewsbury? Yeah, yeah Shrewsbury. Shrewsbury. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I think it was. Um, yeah. I mean, listen, everything, it's one of those days, everything you hit went in, you know, and you feel for the manager on the other side. You know, that's that's a, that's a thing because there's nothing much you can do. I've been on the end of a, of a, of a trenching like that on a couple of occasions where there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Goals are flying in from everywhere. But, um, yeah, but it was good because what he did as well, you know, as well early in the tenure, gave the lads a lot of belief that they had that ability to score goals. And um, I think that was that was the big turning point, obviously. Uh, but he was still, you're not going to win every game seven, you know, but the odd, the odd game that you're still in the game, you know, you can win it one nil or whatever it may be. And, um, and, and thankfully, we did that in, in that in that first season. Is it tough as well sometimes? Because as a manager, you're always like the, the figurehead of the, the club, aren't you? The one that's put in front of the media all the time. So if there are things happening elsewhere in the club or it's bad form or things like that, you're the one that has to go out and uh, and kind of speak to everyone. How have you always found that part of the part of the job? Um, I, I don't mind it, really. I've, I've, I've always struck up a good relationship with media and, 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 and what have you, simply because... I set out on, on my first my first job at, at, um, at Barnsley was after the game, I, I, I've been waiting many, many times for managers to come out of of um, the dressing rooms or what have you, and then they do the they press an hour later, hour and a half later. Keep on, and there's nothing more antagonising for lads who want to go home to their families just like just like we do. Mm-hmm. You know, and they've got to, they've got to still got a job to do. They want to get at home and, on a Saturday night and, and maybe see the kids before they go to bed or Whatever it may be, if it's a night game, it's midnight before they get in the way. And, and I always vow that I'd try and do the press within a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes after the game. Once I've had me, a little bit of a debrief with the with the players, I go and do it straight away. Before I even go to the boardroom or anything like that, I would do that. And, uh, and so I think that bit of mutual respect worked well for us as we went along. And uh, I think I hope that the press understood that, why I was doing it. Um, not to get nice reviews and not to do this on the other but you know, just to let them understand it's a tough one from my point of view as well. Mm-hmm. So some of the questions that you get, you know, are very, very demanding, you know, and not always you can answer them. Some quite um, difficult ones that you have to skirt around and, and you have to skirt it around from from your point of view to help the players because you don't want to stick the players out there and, and hang them out to dry. And, and that's one thing I never did. Um, but some of the questions you get, you could quite easily do that. Mm-hmm. So you've got to be on your guard. You've got to be understanding of a lot of the literacy of, of English uh, language and you've got to understand what people mean when they ask certain questions and, um, and thankfully I was I was quite okay with that type of thing think quick and bite your tongue sometimes <laughs> maybe yeah. to do yeah. things like that so many times by the way I yeah. imagine there's yeah. times that you wanted to come out and say something and you're like no not a yeah. good idea right now well, it's exactly right you do you, you, you just can't say certain things that you would like to say and you'd like to sell the fans but it, it's just it's just Things you just cannot do, unfortunately. Um, in an ideal world, you possibly could, but football's not an ideal world. Yeah. So, so obviously, you had a, a, the little spell at, at Chesterfield, didn't you? It didn't quite work out. But it, it, I think looking back now, the fans look back and, and say, oh, actually, if we'd have kept you for, if you'd have been there for longer, you'd have, we might not have ended in the situation we ended up in because it was just a <clears throat> one of those, uh, just got into a rhythm of losing and, and just kept, Kept losing, unfortunately, but yeah. um, so it must be odd for you seeing seeing Chesterfield now in a now in the National League. It's it's mm. obviously quite a, quite a strong league now. Some quite good teams in it, but well, that's um, the problem. Yeah. It's, it's sad to see them where they are. It was sad to see them relegated, and uh, and I said at the time um, because of all the things that we're having to do, people had to understand there's going to be a bit some a lot of bumps in the road, and and to stay up again, you know, would have been the challenge. Not, not to go on and, and try and get to top six or things like that, mid-tail, just stay up. And then to try and build on it. And I felt at that time, the, my sacking was stupid uh, because I've, I've been through all that. The players have been through this situation before, knew, knew how to get out of it. This, that wasn't a situation for young kids. It was a situation where, where senior players could, could help enormously. Yes, the old, the old one or two might be in the team, uh, young ones. But more than anything, we've been in that situation before. We had the experience, and I certainly have. Um, so I felt I, I didn't see I didn't see the sense in it really. 
Um, but at the same time, that's how I come in anyway. You know, so it's um, it wasn't a surprise to me. It wasn't a surprise, uh, I'm sure, to one or two other people. Um, but what was a surprise was afterwards with the mental players that started coming into the club, um, where we weren't allowed to bring many in at all. You know, and certainly we were we were scrounging for free transfers or uh, for players to come in on loan and we give them a couple hundred quid a week and the clubs are saying, well, if he comes in for that, you've got to play him. And he comes in, maybe not good enough to play. So it was a, it was a real, real um, dilemma at times and very, very difficult to manage. And then when, obviously, when I left, then you see players coming in, you know, on a regular basis, I'm thinking, well, why why, why now? And you know, why not before? You know, we could have we could have addressed this quite easily and still been in League One. I and mean, we would have been in still in League One. I, I can, I would, I would guarantee, I believe that Paul Hart would have still been in League One. Um, had I been there, um, and I don't say that as a big, I, I generally believe that we still been there because we'd have managed it. Um, but then again, it, it just from then onwards, it just went, you know, completely off the scale. And who would have, who would have thought they'd been in the National League? I'm so actually, no. Mm. So finally, just have a, uh, just tell me about the book. How, how did that all come about? How long has it taken to? Kind of put things together for it. Um, well, I, I, I've been I've been asked on numerous occasions whether I'd be interested in doing it. I've always said no because I'm not that type of person. I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm a fairly uh, quiet lad, and I'm, I, can't, I like my privacy in, in terms of, of that. So, uh, yeah, I'm not quite a, an open book, so to speak. Um, but I, I got in, I got invited um, for a chat with uh, Matthew Mann, my ghostwriter, and. And Barry Pierpoint used to be chief executive at um, Leicester City. So, um, so in that respect, uh, I just said, yeah, I'll come and talk to you. And, and they put it over in a way that I, th- I thought, well, you know, I've, I've listened to this. I'll go on first and I'll, uh, I'll talk to Karen, uh, my wife, uh, and the kids and just see what they think. Uh, because it was, it's, it's going to involve a lot of, you know, um, family um, stories. Um, although it's mainly about my, my career in football, there is obviously one or two things that, that are put in there. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, they just said, you know, it's something to leave behind for you, for the family. And we just had um, a young grandson, my son, Laurie, I just had his first grandchild, uh, first child and our uh, first grandchild. And then a second one came along about six months ago. So we just felt, you know, for Carrie and, and Laurie, uh, my son and daughter, um, it's good from, from their point of view to maybe hand it down. And all they'd see was a, maybe the granddad and, and what have you know, uh, football shorts and, and not understand really what, what went on. And so it was a real, I just wanted to leave him something, just something that he could share later on. And uh, and that's what it's about. You know, it's, uh, it's it's something, you know, that I've had to put in one or two things that put the the, the um, points right in, in, and the stories right and get people to understand the truth of certain situations. Um, and there's a lot of bit of fun in it as well. Um, some situations have been caught up in throughout playing and managing. And um, so, yeah, it's, that's how it came about. And um, it was through Matthew and, and through Barry that convinced me really to just go and do it. And it's been it's been a joy to do it. It brought back so many fantastic memories for me. Um, I had to look up a lot of stuff. I, you know, I just forgot so many things. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but Karen's been a great help as well as the kids as well. So, yeah, it's, it's uh, hopefully, you know, it's, it's not out there really to, to make money. It's really just a bit of a legacy to leave behind. Will you be tempted back? Do you think at any point, or uh, to kind of get involved, or do you think that's uh, you've you've done your time, you've had enough experiences, I suppose? <laughs> well, I have. I think, and I think in uh, in terms of um, uh, of management, I would de- I have a very much doubt I'd be back in in that role. Um, I think the the way that the the trend is going at the moment in time is for young managers now coming out of academies, mm-hmm. things like that. You know, I don't think there's a room for a lot of experience. Uh, people, there's loads of experienced managers out of work and, and don't really like to come back in. I think it's a, it's changing the trend, um, but I still think you know the the game's missing out on on the experience that's out there um, that's that's missing out. And I think young young managers coming in could do with you know a bit of help and an understanding how you manage upwards, you know, because that's a, one of the toughest parts. Handling media, things like that, you know, even even problems within the dressing room. Um, and sometimes it's good to to be able to lean back to somebody who's had that that problem, um, you know, and and help them through it. And I think that there's loads of managers out there who could who could fit that bill quite easily. Um, so I think if if anything did happen, it would be in that area. Um, but I don't really see that happening as well. You know, there's a lot of fear 
may be out there that, that you're after the jobs, which you, which you're certainly not. You know, you've been through all that stuff and you don't want to go in again. <laughs> so, um, so you never say never, but um, I'm a very much doubt it. Yeah. Great. Well, well, thanks so much for uh, for coming out and having a chat. I really appreciate it. I will, uh, I will we'll plug the book around all of the uh, all of the Chesterfield fans. Uh, I'm sure and they're, they're all picking up on it anyway. I'm sure. And then, uh, uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, I'm really looking forward to reading it myself. It'll be uh, very kind. Cool.